for being in this place. Because we are not enough, but it's only through you that we have any chance, Lord. Not for a minute, not even for a second have you forsaken us. You have always, always been there for us. And we know that you're here today. We feel your presence. We ask that you send the Holy Spirit upon us to open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts to your message, Lord. We praise you. Amen. So as you know, the past, the eight weeks, this is week eight of a sermon series, one of the biggest areas of our life that we deal with is our work. We put in 40, 50, maybe even more hours than that a week into our jobs. But most of us, most of us leave our Bibles at home. And not just our Bibles, but our faith. We leave it at home. It's, it's not that we deny God at work. We just don't think about Him there. Or maybe we don't see Him as being relevant at our work. Because our job is our job, and our faith is our faith. Two separate worlds. But that's not the vision that God has for it, this isn't our work life over here and our spiritual life over here. There is just life. And it's meant to be lived spiritually. All of it. Including our jobs. So what does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. This series, Wisdom for Life, that is week number eight. We're going to look at that today. We've looked at all the key issues in our life. We've looked at parenting and marriage, money and relationships. Well, today we're going to look at the wisdom that Proverbs has to offer us for our work, for the marketplace. You see, some people seem to think that they have to leave their Bibles, that they have to leave their faith at home when they go to work. But in fact, we are commanded, though, to do whatever job we're doing as if we're working for the Lord. So in Proverbs, we're going to see seven specific areas of wisdom about work itself. Now, these aren't in any particular order, but the first one is certainly the one that's talked about in Proverbs the most. And it's a lesson that goes far beyond our jobs. That first lesson that we learn, it talks about the wisdom of just plain hard work. And the, the wisdom is simple. It pays off to work hard. Proverbs chapter 6 puts it this way. It says, so how long are you going to lay around doing nothing? How long before you get out of bed? A nap here, a nap there, a day off here, a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do you know what comes next? Just this, ju you can look forward to a dirt poor life, poverty, your permanent house guest. Then in Proverbs 10, it says this, Lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. Proverbs 12 says, Work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Proverbs 14 puts it this way, Hard work always pays off. Mere talk puts no bread on the table. And then in Proverbs 20, it says, A farmer too lazy to plant in the spring has nothing to harvest in the fall. 
Don't be too fond of sleep. You'll end up in the poorhouse. Wake up and get up. Then there will be food on the table. Do you get the idea? The Bible would say that the marketplace math works like this. Work hard and you'll be successful. If you don't work hard, you won't be successful. It's really rather simple. But I feel like God thinks that we don't get it. And that's why this wisdom is listed over and over again. God knew that we would need to be reminded of this over and over again. It reminds me of something I once heard about a teenage boy who wanted to have a better physique. So he bugged his dad over and over again to get him a set of weights. And one day, the father took his son to the sporting goods store to, to look at those weights. And knowing that his dad wasn't too sure about those weights, the son said, Please, Dad, I promise I'll use them every day. The father said, I know. I'm not, I'm not sure, though. I mean, this is a big commitment on your part. The son said, Please, Dad father said you know they're not cheap either they they cost a lot of money but his son was persistent he said i'll use them dad i promise i will use them every day you'll see father finally gives in he goes and he pays for the equipment and then turns and starts to head for the door after he takes a couple steps he hears his son behind him wait you mean I have to carry them out? <laughs> See, that's the mindset we all have to conquer. See, none of us embrace laziness in theory. It's just in practice. And it's not just laziness that we have to be on guard against. But it's also about avoiding finding the shortcut. You know, the, the silver bullet, winning the lottery ticket, a small investment that pays off big, the get-rich-quick schemes. The Bible calls these chasing fantasies. Proverbs 12 says this. It says, A hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. And then Proverbs 28 almost says the same thing, but a little bit different. It says, a hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies ends up in poverty. See, there, there's a type of laziness that doesn't involve sleeping all day, but it does involve avoiding the kind of work that's needed to get ahead. And it's a form of laziness because its goal is to find a way to easy money independent of hard work. Here's another way that we can be lazy. Making excuses. Proverbs chapter 26 says this. It says, loafers say it's dangerous out there. Tigers are prowling the streets and then pull the covers back over their heads. See, this is the person who's always making excuses as to why they can't work, or at least why they can't work hard. They give the appearance of being willing to work hard, but they always have a reason why they can't do something why they can't push themselves, why they can't work up a sweat or do something challenging. My leg hurts. My car's broke down. My dog is sick. My second cousin, twice removed, is in the hospital, and even though they won't let me in to see him, I gotta go. In truth, it's just a way out of hard work. But the Bible would say again and again, there's one and only one formula for success. Hard work. 
second bit of wisdom is just as direct. After telling us to work hard, it tells us to don't cheat. Proverbs 11 puts it this way. It says, God hates cheating in the marketplace. He loves it when business is above board. Then in chapter 16, he says this, better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. Then again in Proverbs 16, he says, God cares about honesty in the workplace. Your business is his business. And then these verses from chapter 20 says, switching price tags and padding the expense account are two things God hates. Then in verse 17, he says, food gained by fraud tastes sweet to a man, but he ends up with a mouth full of gravel. Then in verse 23, he says, God hates cheating in the marketplace. Rigged scales are an outrage. See, cheating is a simple idea. It's deceiving someone, tricking them, swindling them, defrauding them. The reason why scales is mentioned here is because back in that day, scales were used to measure out things that were of value, things like money and metals and, or grain or anything of value, they used a scale to measure it out. And merchants would carry around stones of different weights in order to weigh and measure out quantities of silver for payment. Now, there was no governmental agency back then overseeing weights and measures. And since silver was weighed against a stone, weights with dishonest labels were used for cheating. And if the scales were dishonest, you didn't get your money's worth, or you paid more than you should have. Now, there's two big ideas here. The first, as we read, is God hates cheating. Because like any sin, it's ultimately a sin against him. Honesty is from God. He is the ultimate scale, the ultimate standard for every human life. So honest scales are a reflection of God. Dishonest scales go against him. You're not being clever when you cheat. You're going against God. But then we're told that not only does God hate it, but that in the end, it doesn't even work. It doesn't ultimately get you ahead. Now, the, the next wisdom principle that we're going to see in Proverbs is the wisdom to be generous. Proverbs 18 puts it this way. It says, giving a gift can open up doors. It gives access to important people. Proverbs 19 says it this way. Lots of people flock around a generous person. Everyone's a friend of a philanthropist. Now, don't confuse this with bribing somebody. The Bible is very clear when it comes to bribery. Proverbs 15, 27 says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family, but he who hates bribes will live. Bribing is doing something illegal. Being generous is more about the practice of doing good things for people when it's possible and appropriate. So that you can build the kind of relationship and goodwill that will serve you in your career and your business. And when done ethically, when done appropriately, it's the wise thing to do. 
For example, we rent this facility that we sit in from Triad Church who meets here on Sundays. While we pay them a monthly rent, we are ultimately also here based upon their good pleasure. If they decided not to renew our lease, we'd have to find somewhere else to meet. So we look for ways to bless them beyond paying rent for allowing us to meet here. That's one of the reasons why we try so hard to always leave the building cleaner than the way we found it. It's just a small thank you for letting us use this facility. So we try to bless them because they bless us. It's ultimately good business sense. So what have we seen so far? You work hard, you don't cheat, you be generous. The fourth method, the fourth thing we're going to learn is to develop yourself. Proverbs 22 says it this way. It says, do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. You see, it's one thing to work hard, but it's another to reach a level of competency and proficiency and skill in your work that is rewarded not simply on the basis of your effort, but on your ability. The Bible tells us that if we want to do well in the marketplace, we need to be skilled at what we do. We need to strive for a level of excellence, a level of expertise that sets us apart. Because leaders, probably heard this said before, leaders are learners. If you want to make your mark, be a student your entire life. Read all that you can. Be, go to seminars and workshops and conferences and learn how to be a better employee. The fifth area is hiring well. Pretty straightforward. Proverbs chapter 26 puts it this way. It says, an employer who hires a fool or a bystander is like an archer who shoots at random. That's important imagery. An archer shooting arrows at random today, we probably would call that person a loose cannon. The wisdom is among the most important for those who are in leadership. I'll speak for myself because we have, I've hired employees before, but even here at the church, even though you aren't being paid, your volunteers and choosing the right volunteers is important. The biggest leadership mistakes I've ever made have been in hiring. The biggest leadership successes I've ever made have also been in hiring. There are five C's to hire well. The first and most foundational thing is character. I know we are all sinners. I'm not talking about perfection, but it's often said that integrity is who you are when no one else is looking. So we want people that you don't have to look after that you know will do the work without somebody looking over their shoulder. The second dynamic to look for is competence. Raw capability, the essential skills needed to do a job. Now, I'm not talking about whether they have the people skills or the aptitude, the leadership, the, the attitude that you need. They have to have that competence. The third mark to look for is whether or not they are catalytic. Do they create activity? Do they bring energy and have a spring in their step that makes things happen? 
You could use the word hungry or aggressive to characterize them because, quite frankly, I would rather have to try and rein someone in than have to keep kicking them in the butt to do something. The fourth thing to look at for hiring well is chemistry. Simply ask yourself, do you like them? Now, think about how you feel when someone sticks their head in your door on a Tuesday morning. Are you glad to see them? Or does their very persona suck the life out of you? When you check your email and you see something from them in your inbox, do you get a good feeling or a bad feeling? Do you read it first or do you dread even opening it ever? See, make no apologies for hiring people you like. Because life is too short to put yourself on a team with people that just don't work well together. Good chemistry results in good team. The fifth characteristic is they should be called. Now, you may think that this one doesn't transfer to good teams, that doesn't transfer to the marketplace, but it does. Calling has to do with natural abilities and gifts, a a sense of purpose and vocation, a direction in their life. Because you want to hire people to do who and what they are. You want teachers teaching, administrators administrating, leaders leading, and you certainly don't want me singing. You don't want to hire someone just because they need a job. You want it to be a reflection of who God made them to be. The goal is calling. That they would do it whether or not they get paid to do it. Now the sixth bit of marketplace counsel is one that I struggled to come up with a term for, but what I put was, don't power up. That's probably one you're thinking, what in the world does that mean? That's why I struggled with the term for it. It's particularly dealing here with the poor. I think some verses will help to illustrate what I'm talking about. From verse chapter 28, verse 3, it says, a person who oppresses the poor is like a pounding rain that destroys the crops. Then in verse 8 it says, income from charging high interest rates will end up in the pocket of someone who is kind to the poor. Verse 16 says, among leaders who lack insight, abuse abounds. But for one who hates corruption, the future is bright. In all of those verses, there is one main point. Those in power should never take advantage of those without power. The employer should never take advantage of their employees. Don't use power or indebtedness or position to in any way take advantage of another person simply because they can't do anything about it. Throughout the Bible, there's a bias toward the poor and powerless, caring for them, defending their rights, protecting them against oppression. It's all throughout the Bible. In fact, in Exodus, we read that charging excessive interest for profit was condemned. Exodus 22 says, If you lend money to my people, To any of the down and out among you, don't come down hard on them and gouge them with interest. If you take your neighbor's coat as security, give it back before nightfall. It may be your neighbor's only covering. What else does the person have to sleep in? And if I hear the neighbor crying out from the cold, I'll step in, I'm compassionate. That last line, 
ought to be a wake-up call. Because I don't think any of us want God stepping in to defend anyone against us. Now, don't, be, don't misunderstand that it's not interest is wrong in itself or that it can't even be a means for profit. But when it comes to the poor, there's to be compassion when charging them for the necessities of life. If, if anything, use your position to help them despite the bottom line. So let's recap. We've gone through six. We're about to hit the seventh. The first is work hard. Then it's don't cheat. Then be generous. Then develop yourself. Hire well. Don't power up. The final one is don't be a workaholic. It's a tough one for many of us. Proverbs chapter 23 says this, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. Many people learned that all too hard this year. For it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. The term workaholic was coined by Dr. Wayne Oates back in 1968 in an article he wrote for a psychology journal. He coined the word workaholic because of his observation that work is often like a narcotic. It can become addictive and compulsive, something that can be difficult to handle with restraint and moderation. I read an article that listed six different types of workaholics. Some of us are what's called an identity workaholic. Our work defines us. It tells us who we are. So we build our lives around it because it is our life. We live for the recognition, the awards, the prestige. Some of us are perfectionist workaholics. We put in the long hours because something within us has to make everything perfect. Some of us are workaholics for approval. We work and work and work because we're afraid of saying no to anyone's request for our time and energy. We're people pleasers. So you come in early, you stay late, you'll come in on the weekend because you're looking for that approval. And some of us are situational workaholics. We tell ourselves that the long hours are only temporary. But then there's always another situation. There's always another crisis, always another season, so that it never seems to end. Then some of us are escapists. We are workaholics because we don't want to have to face what's outside of work, what, what awaits us at home. So we stay at work because that's a safe space. And finally, there's the materialist workaholic. This is when you just want more and more and more of what money brings you. So you work and work and work to get it. But regardless of what kind of workaholic you are, Oates was right when he chose the word he chose. It's an addiction. Left untreated, it will do great harm in your life and in your family's life. Nobody, and I mean nobody on their deathbed, will ever think, I wish I had spent more time at work. So that's some of the wisdom from Proverbs for your job, for the marketplace. Seven strategic 
areas that will serve us well at work. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for the wisdom that you give us in the Proverbs. So often, we only focus on the things that have to do with church. We, we, as a church, talk about job over here and church over here, but it's not supposed to be that way. We're to live one life, and we're to live it spiritually, and you provide wisdom in how to do that. You tell us how to be Christians in our daily life, in our work, because that is ultimately the biggest area that we will impact those who don't know you. If when we're at work, if they don't see you in us at work, why would they ever come when we invite them to church? But if they see you, Jesus, in us, in our daily lives, They'll want to know why we're so different, what makes us that way. And then when you invite them, they may be willing to come and find out who that is that's inside of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for always centering us on Jesus our Redeemer. In His name, amen.